and come on out, Amy D. So during a summer break from college, I worked on an archaeological dig. And one day I was paired with this woman named Jasmine. And Jasmine was really, she was unusual. Um, this was in the early 80s, and she had dreadlocks. I'd never seen that before. And she wore the same clothes every single day, and she was always barefoot. So Jasmine, she was a hippie, but then she was also from New York City. So it was, it was sort of an oxymoron, you know? It was like when you say pretty ugly, you know? Or you, you say a militant pacifist, you know? Or you say plus size skinny jeans. It just, you know. <laughs> it just seemed off for me. So, so that morning, it was 110 degrees, and Jasmine and I made our way down into this 10 foot deep trench. And immediately, I realized that Jasmine had the worst BO I have ever smelled in my life. I mean, this was toxic body odor. It was horrible. It was, it was that smell. You know, that smelly smell. That, that smelly smell, it smells just really smelly. You know what I mean? Now, I am all for free expression but not when you're five feet away from me, digging in a ditch that's hotter than the sun, okay? So that morning, all I could think about while I was digging was rubbing Jasmine's nose with Lady's speed stick and, and, and burying her in the dirt. <laughs> so by the time we broke for lunch, I just raced to my car because I wanted to get to a stink-free zone. <laughs> and I jumped into my car and I pulled the door shut and I took a deep breath and what? The smell had followed me into the car. I looked behind me to see if Jasmine had sneaked into the back seat, but no. And all of a sudden, I thought, Wait a minute. It was me. All along, I had the stinky B.O. I smelled like the sweaty sumo wrestler. And you know, it had never occurred to me to smell my own pits first. So this is a great example of what behavioral health scientists called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is when we seek out evidence to confirm what we already believe, but we dis dismiss evidence that contradicts what we believe. And we all do it. We all do it. We do it with religion. We do it with politics. We even do it at home. We make a statement in our heads, and then we find evidence to prove that it's true. So let's take an example. Say I'm home one day, and I'm va vacuuming the floor. I'm vacuuming, and I see my husband Steve's shirt crumpled on the floor, and I'm slightly annoyed. But then I find out that there are some dirty socks under the bed. And now I'm quite irritated, and I make a statement in my head. And I think, you know what? Steve doesn't respect me. And I'm more, no more than a maid to him. And suddenly, I see Steve's stuff all over the house. I see his glass on the kitchen counter. I find three of his whiskers in the bathroom sink. And you know what? He left the toilet seat up again. Well, I guess it'll just be the old maid who takes care of that, huh? So by the end of the day, I have found enough evidence to prove that Steve doesn't respect me, that he doesn't love me, and that I'm no better than a maid to him, and I am fuming. I have smoke coming out of my ears. And Steve comes in the door, not suspecting anything, and he says, hey, honey, I'm hungry. What's for dinner? And I start pelting him with his dirty socks. Eat that, jerk. And he, he has no idea. I ambushed him. We do it at work. 
We do it at work. Say, for example, your company has never had a cell phone policy. They're very lenient about it, and all of a sudden, they come out with a policy that states you cannot carry your cell phone on you, that you have to have it with, to tuck it away, and you can only use it during lunch or breaks. And now your coworkers and you are sitting around, and you're angry about it because no one likes things taken away. And you start thinking about, you know, all the managers are kind of jerks, aren't they? And they're pretty unfair. And so one of your coworkers said, yeah, think about the break room. You know that refrigerator? There's a policy that says food has to be thrown away after four days. But Ernie Wadensky, he has had a tuna fish sandwich in there since like October of 2006. In fact, it growls at me every time I open the refrigerator door. But I guess it's okay, because he's a manager. And someone else says, oh yeah, they used to sell peanut M&Ms in the vending machine. But now it's only plain M&Ms. I guess because Eileen Dover, Eileen Dover has a peanut allergy. And I guess that they just, they don't want one of the managers to, to go into an anaphylactic reaction. And someone else says, yeah, you know, come to the think about it, we've, we've not had toilet paper in the ladies' room for like three days. So I guess it's just paper towels, not now on out for us peons. <laughs> you make a statement in your head, and you find evidence to prove that it's true, and we all do this. We fall into the confirmation bias trap. Because every day we have so much information that we have to pro process that we seek out information processing shortcuts. And we do this because it's a super easy way for our brain to cut down on the amount of work that it has to do. Because after all, it's a lot easier to pay attention to information that confirms what we already believe rather than to have to sort out all the other angles of a problem. So how do we avoid confirmation bias? So we avoid confirmation bias by purposely considering the other side. Purposely considering the other side. So let's take the cell phone policy, for example. So it could be that your managers are jerks. That could be the reason. But it could also be that your managers read a recent study that says that employees who carry smartphones check them 97 times a day. You know, maybe they just want you to be more invested in your work. So it could be that. So in order to, and here's the other side about confirmation bias. Not only are you prone to confirmation bias, but everyone else is too. That means your clients, your customers, your patients, are also prone to this narrow-minded thinking. And why does that matter? It matters because we all know that a first impression takes less than 10 seconds to make. So in less than 10 seconds, your customer has decided whether you care or you couldn't care less. And now they are seeking out information to prove that that first impression is true. Now you represent your company. So if you make a fantastic first impression, that's great for the company. But if you make a bad first impression, that can be very detrimental to your company. But even more important than that, even more important than representing your company or your hospital, is that in this world, you represent you. You are once and forever and for always. You are called into this world. So every day your interaction shows this world who you are. And that's bigger than the hospital that you work for or the company that you work for. So today as you go out, I challenge you. And the first challenge is that as you meet other people, you treat every encounter with another human being as a sacred encounter. And the second challenge that I give to you is if you have a negative first impression, if you have a negative first impression that you reconsider and you give that person a second chance, 
Because the truth is that we all have days that stink. And we all have behaviors that sometimes stink. And I'll tell you what I know. I know that somewhere in New York City, there's an old hippie. And she's telling her grandkids, I'm telling you, those women in the Midwest do not wear deodorant. <laughs> I'm a psychiatric nurse. And so I teach the science and the methods to shift your employee's perspective. And as a final little tip, before you rag out on someone else, smell your own pits first. <laughs> Thank you.